Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm Jennifer Troyer. I'm Dean of the Bell College of Business here at UNC Charlotte. On behalf of the Bell College and the Children's Client Center for Real Estate, I'm really pleased to welcome you to our 2022 State of Housing in Charlotte Summit. Um, a special welcome to the elected officials and board members who are attending our summit today and to our sponsors who ge whose generous support helped make this event possible. For those of you who have not been to the Dubois Center before, have, has anybody not been to this facility before? Okay. Um, so this, um, this is our uptown campus for UNC Charlotte. It opened about a decade ago. Um, as Charlotte's public research university, we use this space to serve our students um, in the region to engage with our research partners and to do things like this for our community. Um, all 11 floors are buzzing in the evenings here with students taking afternoon and evening classes. We have about 1,400 students every semester that, that take classes here, um, including students from all of our master's programs from the Belt College of Business, and, including our master's in real estate program. Um, also housed in this building is our master's of urban design, which may be of interest to this audience. Um, and then, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that since 2018, we've also had this uptown campus connected to our main campus by the Lynx Blue Line extension, which is great for our students. So we are going to start today with the presentation of the 2022 State of Housing in Charlotte report, um, followed by a question and answer session. And then we will take questions, we will take questions from our audience here, um, and we will take questions for the, from those who are joining remotely via Zoom. So if those of you who are, um, those of you who are joining us remotely via Zoom, feel free to ask your questions at any time by entering your questions in the chat. Um, for those of you here, we'll have microphones after, after Yang Chang does his presentation. Uh, for those of you on Twitter, you can join today's conversation by using hashtag CLT housing, and we look forward to seeing and sharing your tweets. And now it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague and today's speaker, Dr. Yang Chun Chu. Um, Dr. Chu is the director for the Childress Klein Center for Real Estate, and he is the Childress Klein Distinguished Professor of Real Estate and Urban Economics in the Bell College. He is a highly regarded scholar who has done groundbreaking research in the areas of real estate, corporate finance, and banking. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Yang Chun Chu. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, thanks for joining us today uh, for this uh, event. So um, first of all, I want to thank all our sponsors for, for this. Without them, uh, this event would not be possible. So we have Faison, um, uh, Canopy, Realtors Association. We have True Homes and uh, Greater Charlotte Apartment Association, uh, Kingdom Development Partners, and um, also um, Amory um, uh, as well. So they're all here. Um, so let me start with a overview of the like mac more macro level of the region's economy, because a lot of those will affect like the demand and supply of housing uh, in, the, in this region. I'm going to start with the population growth. So I'm plotting the population and population growth for the Charlotte MSA um, during the last um, uh, eight years. So you will notice for these kind of uh, numbers, it's all come, coming from census, but um, census did not do it for the year of 2020 because of COVID. Okay, so, we, so you will see it's uh, 2019 and 2021. So uh, as most of you probably know that population has been growing in the Charlotte region and uh, it's been growing at somewhere between um, uh, 1.5 to 2% range and at annual rate. But from 2019 to 2021, uh, the growth rate is actually slightly lower. It's 1.21%, okay? Um, but still it's growing. And uh, one of the reasons why, uh, why uh, the growth has been uh, slowing down is we used to have about 12 to 13% of international migration, but that 
dropped significantly to 8.5%. So we still have very strong domestic migration into this region. So that's one of the, one of the things. So you may wonder since like population growth is kind of slowing down a little bit during COVID, is that going to impact how, how that's going to impact housing demand? All right, so if we want to look at that, then the other thing we want to look at is the growth in the number of households in this region, right? So you may think, so since population growth is kind of slowing now, maybe the growth rate in number of households will also slow down. But that's not the case, right? So if you look at the annual growth rate from 2019 to 2021, we are seeing the, like the highest growth rate in the number of households in this region over the uh, last decade. We are looking at 3.3% every year, okay? So the reason for that is because the size, the average size of household has been decreasing. So before 2021, you can see that the average number of people in one household has stayed relatively stable around 2.65 people per household. But this number dropped to 2.54 in 2021. Okay, so I do not really know what is the driving force for that, but this is what's happening. So we are seeing a very high growth rate in the number of households, right? So that will translate into a very strong demand for housing in this region. Okay, so it has been strong, but this is just going to make that demand even stronger uh, in this region. All right. So now let's look at a little bit kind of from the supply side of the things to understand the dynamics. So here, what I'm plotting is the number of housing units in this region. So that's the total number of housing units, including owner-occupied, including rental units, right? So it's also growing, right? So um, in 2019, we, the growth rate was really good, 3.32%. But during the COVID years of 2020, 2021, the annual growth rate has decreased to 2.5%. Now you can see there is going to be a disconnect, right? So the number of households increased dramatically during the COVID years, but the number of housing units are not increasing as much as um, the the um, the number of households. So the other way to look at it is I'm plotting here the changes in the number of housing units and the changes in the number of households in this region, okay? So uh, again, I'm starting from 2014, but before that, after the great financial crisis of 2008, 2009 uh, financial crisis, what happened um, nationwide, also in Charlotte region is we are experiencing significant underbuilding. That means the, number, the increase in the number of households outpaced the increase in the number of housing units since 2010, right? And actually in the Charlotte region, this phenomenon got alleviated a little bit in 2018 and 2019 where we are building more housing units than the increase in the number of households during those two years. So we did pretty good in those two years. So supply finally was trying to catch up with the demand. But guess what? The COVID pandemic disrupted the whole process. So this number, this is the change, two years of change. This is not one year change. We are not building a lot more than the previous years. So these are the two years change. So this is changed from 2019 to 2021. So that's why you see these bars are much higher. But the, 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 the most important thing to, to look at this is that this bar is for the increase in the number of households from 2019 to 2021. And this one is for the increase in the number of housing units, right? And this that is that shortage, okay? That's 10,000 units, okay? so the region underbuilt about 10,000 units during the COVID years of 2020 and 2021. Okay, so that's this kind of demand and supply dynamics we are experiencing in this region, right? So the other way to look at it is to look at the overall vacancy rates 
of uh, of uh, the housing units, right? So it has been pretty stable, eight percent, nine percent in the previous years. But since we are underbuilding significantly from 2019 to 2021, the vacancy rates actually dropped quite significantly from uh, what we had in 2019. Right? So all these things suggest that we are just not building enough. So the supply side is yet to catch up with the demand side of housing in this market. Okay, so that will give us a pretty good kind of idea of the macro level supply and demand, uh, the demand and supply dy dynamics. Okay, so you can also start to understand why we are seeing price increases over the last uh, uh, 10, 12 years since the Great Recession, right? And of course, next, what I'm going to give you is a more micro level uh, view of what is really happening in the housing market, okay? Because I, we only have very limited time here. So I'm gonna focus mostly here on the single family owner occupied market, but we do have rental markets and other markets in the report. If you're interested, you can also uh, read, read our, our reports, right? So, so um, I want also want to mention, so from this part of the analysis, uh, we use the, the data supplied by uh, Canopy Realtors, so the MLS data. So this is the, the most accurate data uh, we can rely on. So first of all, this is kind of the million dollar question of where the house price has been and where it is gonna go, right? So here, what I'm plotting is the house price dynamics kind of during the COVID pandemic from uh, January, 2020 to September, 2022, right? So of course I'm plotting both the Charlotte region and the Mecklenburg County. I'm plotting both the median price, which is on the, uh, the uh, solid lines, um, uh, on the bottom, and then I'm also plotting the average price. Average prices are always higher, slightly higher than the median price, right? So one thing to tell you several numbers is, if we look at the median price for the Charlotte region, it has increased about 54% from uh, January, 2020 to September, 2022, okay? so. That's 54% over a little over two years. That's very dramatic increase, right? And uh, the other thing that, of course, a lot of people ask, uh, we, nowadays people talk about that the housing market is collapsing or anything. So is it showing up in this? So you can see that the price, the prices hit kind of, the peak around June, 2022, and then started to decrease a little bit, right? That is true. Well, guess what? The same thing happened in 2021, the same thing happened in 2020. So most of those drops in prices are seasonal. It's not because underlying things are changing, right? So we are not seeing dramatic price decreases in this region, at least yet. Right, so, um, so also if we compare uh, for the most recent year from September, 2021 to September, 2022, the annual growth rate was 14.2%. And if you go back by one year, this was reported in our last report from September, 2020 to September, 2021, the growth rate was 16.3%. Right, we are the growth is still kind of very strong, and then that's the fifty-four percent number I was talking about. All right, so the prices we are not seeing big price drops. However, we do see a little bit of softening of the market. So here, what I'm plotting is the median days on the market. So the days on the market is the time between you list the house until the house is under contract, right? So before COVID, it was about 21, 22 days, 
Okay, so you, you list a house, it will take about 20 days to, for this house to be sold, which was already very, very fast, All right? Okay, so now look at what happened during COVID, All right? This is three. So all the crazy stories you heard about, like people need to line up and to, to place an offer, that's all true because you only got three days, right? You're just going to stare at the listings and then, okay, there's one out. I'm going to go place an offer. Guess what? That's not good because you're probably not going to be able to buy the dream house you all, always wanted because you just do not have the time to go through everything, right? Okay, so that continued again until April, May of this year. Now what we are seeing is it's going back up, right? So this is nine days, okay? It's going back up. So it's slowing down, but nine days, remember, nine days. That's all you get to place an order to make the biggest investment in your life, all right? So we are still not there. So the market is still pretty tight. It's slowing down, but it's still pretty tight. The other way to look at it is, this is another thing that people also talk about. What is the percent of houses that are sold above their listing prices, right? So this was the number before COVID hits, right? It was 18, 17%. So 18 and 70% of houses will be sold above their listing prices. At the height, this was 60%. So there's just bidding wars on over 60% of the houses that are listed, right? So now think about it. You have three days to place an offer. And then on that one single house, there are probably also 20, 30, 40, 50 offers on that. Okay, good luck with buying that house. All right, so now, and of course we are seeing big drops in this number in the most recent losses, right? So this is back above 20%. Okay, so just above 20%, but it's still much higher than what we had before COVID hits. It's still pretty tight market. It's slowing down, but not there yet. Okay. So now a little bit about house price distribution. So this is the house price distribution for all houses sold from January 2022 to September 2022, which was the cutoff date of our uh, research, right? So one of the things that people often talk about a like start a home, think about, used to think about, okay, somewhere around $150,000, okay? That's a um, young professional was able to buy as his first home. Guess how much we have that on this market? 3.2%. 3.2%. All right. So our median price is almost $400,000 now in this region. Okay. So, and also the dynamics is also, does not really look very good, especially. So here I'm telling you the dynamics of like different point on the distribution. The 10th percentile, meaning only 10% of houses are sold below that price, okay, 90% above. So from 2011 to 2021, that price point has increased by 15%. And then we go down the distribution, 25th percentile, that increased by about 11%. The median increased, this is annual rate of growth. The median increased 8.15%. 
right? So if you compare this with last two years, you will see, okay, 8%, that's not crazy. 8% is a very crazy number, annual rate over a 10-year period. It's a crazy number, right? A healthy number would be somewhere around 2 to 3%, right? And if you go down even further, you can see the high-end prices actually increase at much slower pace. Okay, so that's creating a problem. When we say affordable housing, these are the ones we should be focusing on. But that's also the ones that increased the most during the last 10 years. And this is completely different than the last, the decade before that, right? The decade before that, we have actually the highest growth rate on the high end, okay? So the supply demand kind of situation has changed a little bit, right? Now, we all know house prices are super high. And what made things even worse is interest rate, right? So this is where we were before COVID. 3%, maybe. This is where we are today. Okay, 7, 7.5%. Okay, but here I'm giving you a very kind of long history of the 30 year fixed rate mortgage interest rate, right? So, first thing is yes, dramatic increases in interest rate. The second thing is is this really that high? Look at it, right? Before the financial crisis, this probably was the norm, right? And these were not the norm. This was because all those quantitative easing monetary policies did after the financial crisis. Right? Two to three percent mortgage interest rates. I mean, that's crazy. Although we all get used to that, we all enjoy that. So, my house, I have a mortgage interest rate of 2.875%. Right? So, this will have the interest rate dynamics will have kind of very dramatic implications on housing affordability and also housing supply. Guess what? Because I have a mortgage of 2.875%, I'm not going to sell it, right? Because if I sell it, if I want to find a new one, I'm going to pay 7.5. I'm just not doing that. Of course, then with the 7.5% interest rate, this makes affordability a significant, significant concern. So now, usually we think about a house is affordable if you spend less than 30% of your gross income on housing-related expense, mortgage expense, property insurance, all those kind of stuff. Now, here I'm going to show you how much income does it take to buy a house price at the 10th percentile, that's lower end. In 2018, you only need to make $45,000, right? 2022, $83,000, right? I see some young people in the audience. Uh, and then look at 25th. 2018, 57,000. 2022, 109,000. Medium price, 2018, $76,000. 2022, $136,000. Okay. So now I'm going to show you the number. How much of the households are actually able to afford it? So these are the numbers. I'm going to use the income distribution to back out. So the 10th percentile, that's the lower end, 
50% of households in the shallow region cannot afford that 10th percentile price. Okay, median, 80% cannot afford the median price, 80%. Okay, so if looking at that, those number, if you do not think affordability is gonna be a concern, rethink it. Okay. So I'm gonna spend two slides on the rental market. Maybe we want to, okay, yeah. Single family house prices are very high. So I'm gonna rent. So let's look at the rental markets. So this is the rental rates over the last 20, uh, 22 years. And so just look at this, look at this. It was good, good, good. And this looks pretty bad. And then look at this, right? So the rental rates went from one uh, to $1,200 per unit to almost $1,600 per unit during the COVID years. Okay, so even if you are renting, it's become also very uh, unaffordable. So this is uh, the single family rental. Okay, so the previous one was apartment rental. This is the single family rental. Again, this data comes from uh, Canopy's data, and this one is from CoStar, a commercial uh, database we bought. Uh, so the same dynamics. Rents are growing at a very similar pace as the house prices. All right, so, and also going forward, since the interest rate is super high, that will push a lot of potential home buyers going to rental markets, right? So the bad news of that is, even if we are going to see price decreases in single family, you are probably not gonna see as much decrease in the rental rates, right? Because 7.5% interest rate, mortgage interest rate, a lot of people cannot afford that. What they're gonna do, rent. Okay, so rental market is as tight as the owner occupied. So now let me kind of transition a little bit to put Charlotte into a broader perspective, trying to compare Charlotte with other cities. Are we the only one, right? So how do we compare with the regional competitor cities? Asheville, Charleston, uh, Columbia. So this is the uh, population growth. So again, we want to know the uh, demand side. So this is population growth. So obviously Charlotte has the highest population among all these, what we call the regional competitor cities, Asheville, Charleston, Columbia, Greensboro, Raleigh, Richmond, and Spartanburg. Right? And we also have one of the highest population growth rates from 2019 to 2021. Uh, only um, Raleigh and the Spartanburg has higher rates, growth rate. Okay, so that tells us the, the demand side. And um, if we compare Charlotte with the national competitor cities, of course, there's Atlanta, has much, much more population. But again, Atlanta has a very low growth rate, 0.4%, Charlotte is 1.1. So in terms of growth rate, we are similar as Indianapolis, right? Uh, Sacramento, or even San Antonio, okay? So demand is still going to be pretty strong given the population growth. And I think the population growth will pick up since we are out of COVID, right? So, that's population. Now let's look at uh, house price. So this house median house price is a little bit different. So this these data are based on census. So we have to base on census because we do not have the MLS data for other cities, right? So just, just to compare uh, oranges to oranges. So everything is based on census data. So this is self-reported uh, house prices by the homeowners, right? So this is again, the regional competitor cities. 
and uh, Charlotte is okay in terms of prices. So this is 2021 price, right? But if you look at the growth rate, Charlotte has the highest median house price growth rate among all these regional competitor cities, right? And of course, if we place it against, compare it against all these national competitor cities, Charlotte is here, only Austin, uh, this is Memphis, and then Tampa has higher population, uh, has higher house price growth rate than Charlotte uh, during the last two years. Right. So now the next thing I want to show you is what we used to call the medium multiple. So what is a medium multiple? The medium multiple is the medium price of houses to the median household income ratio. Okay. Oftentimes we use that also as a measure of how affordable houses are. Okay. We have usually have two kinds of thresholds, three and four. If the ratio is below four, uh, below three, everything's good. It's very affordable, okay? And if the ratio is between three and four, it becomes mildly unaffordable. But if the ratio is above four, that's gonna be a serious concern of affordability, right? So when we started, this project in 2019, our number was 3.5, right? For a city like Charlotte, 3.5 is kind of okay. Most people are still comfortable. Now, 2021, again, because the census, so we only have the 2021 data. 2021, for the first time in history, that median multiple for the Charlotte region, is above four for the first time. And then if you take into consideration the increase in the house price from 21, 2021 to 2022, even if you assume that income has also grown, this number will be even higher, okay? So here, Charlotte is slightly above four. Okay, I do not have the exact number, but I can do a back of envelope calculation. We are somewhere around 4.15 or 4.2, 2022. Okay, so that's a concern, right? So in the regional ones, of course, there are other cities that look even worse. Raleigh, Charleston, but you know why. Uh, but not Raleigh, Asheville and Charleston, but you know why Asheville and Charleston. Right, so because retiring people moving there, tourism, a lot of that. Okay, so the economy are very different in those two cities that um, shocked. Of course, Raleigh is also hitting. That. Okay. So of course, if you put it at a national stage, then there are a lot of other cities that are already crossed that line as well. Not surprisingly, Austin, right? So nowadays we hear about stories about Austin all the time. Okay, so that's not surprising. And Charlotte is here, Denver. Denver has been there for many, many years, right? And then we have Nashville catching up, Portland, Sacramento. These two are have been there for many years as well. But the problem is we are getting there as well. Right, so there are of course many many factors be behind that, but we are getting there. Right, so we certainly do not want to be here. Right, we all know how unaffordable in those cities are. We still want to grow. I think growth is a good thing, but we need housing to accommodate that growth. Okay. I don't think a policy that says, okay, you guys just do not come to Charlotte, that just doesn't work. I think the policy should be, let's make, of, make the housing more affordable so that people 
people business still want to move to Charlotte, right? So what it takes, right? So I have been telling the story. So at some point I was saying compromise. What do we have to compromise? How we are gonna be able to and make housing more affordable. So given the demand is strong and we do not want to restrict demand as, as, as far as my, I, I concern, I do not think restricting demand is good policy. So how do we do it? Increase supply. Okay, that means what? That means probably more density. That means probably less green space. So last year when I said compromise, at some point, the word sacrifice slipped out of my mouth. Right? So, and then people started calling me Professor Sacrifice. <laughs> um, but this is the kind of compromise we probably should be taking, right? To make housing more affordable so that we will see more growth for the city of Charlotte, which will make Charlotte a better place, okay? So, so with that, I'm gonna close my presentation and I welcome whatever questions you guys may have. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Um, so we're now moving on to the Q&A portion of the presentation, and we're going to begin with a question from the live audience. So we have a couple microphones floating around. Ah, here they come. Okay, here we go. So we've got one on each aisle. So if, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and we'll, we'll get you a microphone. The microphone helps for the folks who are on Zoom. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. Go ahead. Oh, hi everyone. Thank you. Uh, amazing presentation. I just wanted to ask for clarification, uh, knowing how large Canopy is now, territorial wise. Your Charlotte Regional Median, if you could just kind of explain how you quantify that out of the Canopy area. Uh, so. Good question. So this is a Mecklenburg County and the seven other counties bordering Mecklenburg County. So that will be uh, the Union County, the Cabarrus County, Gaston County, gosh, Iredell, uh, York County, Lancaster County of South Carolina. Maybe one more. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, so more generally, the MSA will include other counties as well, but we are only, so, so for that analysis, it's only the core of this part eight county. MSA, we can have as much as 16 counties. So yeah. was there, yes. We, can we have the microphone down here? Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Chu, for a very uh, compelling um, presentation so far. I'm curious, and you touched on it towards the end with the price to income ratio and the multiple and showing the growth of that. I'm curious, one thing we, we didn't see a lot of, how has income growth kept up or not kept up with the housing growth? Again, you touched on it toward the end, but if you could elaborate just a little bit more, obviously prices are going up. How is income comparing to that over the same stretch of time? So income has been growing at much, much slower pace than house price, okay? So in the last two years, the income growth rate is less than half of the house price growth rate. So that's creating a problem. If we are seeing income grow as well, then we will, everybody will be happy. So let me do one question from um, Zoom, and then we'll, we'll go back up, up to the top there. So um, how do we increase supply? <laughs> All right, I wish I actually knew the answer and know how to do it. Uh, so there are many things that constrain supply, especially during COVID, we have labor problems, we have material problems. There's almost nothing Charlotte as a city can do about a lot of that. Also the interest rate, this is not something we can do, right? 
what Charlotte can do? Make development easier. Make it less costly to develop. Okay, so except for like really the lower end of the market, let the market figure out the most effective way of supply, right? Ease some of the regulatory burdens that all these builders or developers are facing. Right up there in the back. I uh, just had a quick question. When you talked at the end of the presentation, you talked about the sacrifice that Charlotte had to make to increase um, the supply of homes. You talked See? about less green. <laughs> yeah, you talked about less green space. But one of the things I think that makes Charlotte so attractive to the companies that are here, as well as the people why they're moving here, is the green space. So is it sacrificing green space or making green space more efficient or smarter? So if you want to build more, we are going to see fewer green space for sure, right? And so everybody would enjoy if I, yeah, I have a house on a 20 acre land and everything is beautiful, I will be happy. But that just doesn't work that way, right? So, um, and of course, if you can make green space more efficient, make, make it more accessible, so that we do not actually need that much green space. That also works. So another question from Zoom. Do you think that a prioritization of transportation infrastructure could have the effect of increasing the available supply? Yes, of course. So if we can enlarge the area that people will be able to commute, then that of course works. Um, a very good presentation. Uh, I had a question. Um, I want to know your opinion on the recently adopted UDO, and do you think it actually um, addresses density in a proper way, or do you think it does the opposite? Allison, can you answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> I hope it makes it easy. I'm I'm not I'm not a planning uh, expert. So I don't I really don't know. It's it's a it's a huge document. Right. Okay, one more question from Zoom and then we'll then we'll go back to the microphone. So do you think that household formation will decrease because of the challenge of affordability? At least we are not seeing that. In, in, in our report, we have actually seen more households uh, in this region. With the uh, superficial prices, because you had 60% growth or 60% over asking. Now, this year we have a revaluation coming up and it's going to affect the reval. So you're going to have a higher, you're going to have a superficial price on your home for the next four years. And I know that the reval has just been postponed until March. So I just, and I know Pat Cotham is here and I'm just wondering how it's gonna affect the, uh, the, the, re, the, re, the reval prices. It really, it really depends on how you're gonna do it. If you're gonna market to the market, then yeah, expect the tax bill to increase. Hey, Dr. Chu, nice seeing you outside of class. <laughs> uh, so I have a question since I'm in real estate and investing. Um, going forward, forecasting wise, how do you see the market in the next year or so? Do you see a plateauing or maybe single digit growth? I, I think more likely to be single digit growth. We got a question down here. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned that only 50% of households in the region can afford, I think it's the 10th percentile. Yeah. What is that number or what's the price range? Are we looking at 200,000? Uh, I don't remember exactly. Uh, you look at... Oh. 
uh, it's about 200,000, uh, a little bit above that. Yeah. Thank you. So you just answered a question about housing prices. Let me ask you another one, um, you know, trying to, you know, things are shifting pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the million dollar question is, will there be a price correction? You know, so to start, if you want a price correction, you have to assume the current price is wrong, mm. which I don't think that's the case because it's supported by strong demand. So um, I think the growth will slow down. I do not see a dramatic decrease in the near future. Yes. I, I agree with the growth but I wonder how much of the growth that we're seeing has been inflated because of iBuyers that are now starting to kind of vacate that market space. Uh, so it's very hard to assess how they affected the prices. So it could be they're just getting into the market because they're seeing that price will increase or rent will increase, right? It's very hard to say. And, um, uh, their market share is not super large right now. I'm not sure how much they can drive up uh, the demand here, drive up the price here. Hi, yes. Um, you mentioned making housing more affordable. Have there been any, any talks on how to do that? How to? Make housing more affordable. Um, so again, I wish I knew the, the answer. So for me, if you want a lower house price, again, demand and supply until there is huge government subsidy comes in, then demand and supply tells me there is demand. We're not gonna be able to do a lot about that. Then the only thing we can do is about supply. Increase supply, price goes down. That's the only thing I can think of. Um, my question actually relates to that regarding affordability. I'm curious if you have any thoughts regarding the manufactured housing communities and the industry, if that could be a solution for the city of Charlotte. Yeah. Given how much they've changed. I, I, I would welcome that. So my, my starting point has always been any supply is going to be helpful. So either even from the high end, from the lower end, manufactured housing, I think that will be a good solution to the, to the problem. Hey, Dr. Chu. Yeah. Um, it, when you were doing your research, did you come across any data that quantified how many um, units in the market that are typically home ownership are being held as Airbnbs or short-term rentals? We do not have that data unless we, we can acquire data from Airbnb, but we do not currently have that data on short rentals. If yeah. you ever get that, share it <laughs> because that's, I mean, in other areas where like a resort communities like Asheville, mm -hmm. And Charleston, some of those other yeah, 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 burden, yeah. that's that's a huge um, issue. That's a barrier to yeah. assessing the housing units that are currently in stock. Yeah. But would love to get that if you ever yeah, come across sure. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hi, Dr. Chu. I was wanting to know if you think that community land trust would help alleviate the housing um, shortage and affordability here in the Charlotte Mecklenburg County area. If they are able to build more houses, yes. Or rehab them. Yeah, that works. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was excellent. As you look at other cities, and if you think about that Charlotte could potentially continue on the path that it's on and not answer the supply problem, what have other cities that have gone down that same path, what characteristics are we seeing in those cities that could translate to Charlotte if we can correct? So let's take this, this one. So it's pretty clear people are trying to move out of those regions, right? So because even if you're gonna be able to do business there, your employees will not be able to afford a, afford a reasonable house. And you're gonna be able to attract high quality employees. So that's gonna be a concern. This is kind of my biggest concern for the housing affordability issue as well. 
because so we are seeing very good dynamics in terms of Charlotte attracting uh, business, attracting people here. But if we do not address the housing affordability problem, if we get the median multiple goes to five, then at some point, companies will think, okay, should I just should I actually move to Charlotte? So I think that's not going to be a good thing. So one more question from online, Dr. Chu. So um, does the data reflect townhome sales? Is that, your, is that in the single family numbers? Uh, no, it's not in the single family numbers I present here, but the number is actually in our report. Okay. So this, this question was, you know, has the increase in townhomes as a percentage of new construction affected affordability? I don't think so. been passed. Uh, uh, you're an expert in the field, and I don't question that. And you don't know the answer to what the impact of that is going to be on housing costs. That strikes me as being a little, not on your part, on the people who put that out of negligence. Now, as it happens, those of us who are actually in the field of producing housing can produce numerous examples of regulations that are, have been imposed, which will have an in, increase in the cost of housing. And that is not an issue which the agencies that put forward take into consideration. Uh, so I, I don't know, it's probably do. again, <laughs> Alex and can speak to that. But uh, of course, if you uh, get rid of a lot of the regulation that will help housing supply. But at the same time, there's always going to be a balance, right? Some regulations are there for a purpose, right? But if we can figure out regulations that do a cost and benefit analysis, how much benefit we can get removing one regulation and what is the cost, potential cost of that one? I think this is going to be a more um, practical method of doing this. I'm not going to say all regulations are bad because a lot of regulations serve a purpose that make the city a uh, better place. Yes. Dr. Chu, hi, I'm Ed Driggs. I'm in Charlotte City Council. I agree with you about sacrifice, but I want to warn you, if you ever run for office on a platform of sacrifice, it's not going to end well. Um, See, I understand that. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's important because uh, if, if we, for example, wanted to invest enough to make a huge difference, we would have to raise property taxes to do it. And it, it, we're in a bit of a bind. But my question to you was, uh, you talk about demand as being essentially exogenous, and therefore we have to work on supply. But in fact, as prices go up, isn't there a possibility that the increases in price through a market process choke off some of the demand? Suddenly, Charlotte is not as appealing as it was because of its affordability. And that has been a selling point for us in the past. Yeah, that is true. That is exactly my concern. At some point, this will happen, right? So people are just gonna stop moving to this city. Yes. Sort of tie in the guy, the uh, gentleman with the blue shirt on or jacket or whatever, about, the, uh, not, if I heard you correct, and you, we was, we was bringing more. Okay, can you use your mic? Yeah. I said, increase the supply, Single family, and with Charlotte becoming more of an urban area, we're building more of the multi family characteristics. Yo, how are we going to increase? I don't know, you don't know because they don't know. But the, the, problem, the, problem that I see, the problem that I see is to if we need more supply of single family, but yet we're overbuilding the multi family, how, to get out of that. So, first of all, I don't think I ever said we should just increase supply of single family. No, I mean, balance, I'm talking about basically balance enough. The supply needs is there for single family. Mm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure about that. Okay. So well, I think like overemphasizing single family might be a problem to start with because the land is really fixed. There's just, only the sort of amount of single family you can do. 
At some point, that's why when I say, at some point we need to think about, we probably need more density, vertical, right? Single family might not be the solution there. Okay. Alone, well, I, I mean, okay, well, we, I, we still need single family, but single family alone might not be the solution. Well, okay, I'm gonna let you clarify because I missed. I was think, I was looking at the numbers when we were talking about the green space and the houses, and you said we need to increase the supply. Maybe I went into it and I missed a part about. But the balance is basically what I'm getting at. We're saying the same thing. I may be a little slow getting to it, but the, to increase because the footprint is already there. So no more land is to to balance it out, and that's my concern. Sure. Yeah. Hi, I have a colleague who just asked me to ask, um, how is the inventory supposed to change within the next few months? What, what? The inventory, how is the inventory supposed to change within the next few months? Uh, so it has been changing, right? So during the height of, uh, of uh, the pandemic, the inventory was as low as like uh, 10 to 15 days. I think last time I checked, it was four to five months, which is still low, by the way. Dr. Chu, a uh, quick question. As you look at the Charlotte region and you, you mentioned the need for more housing and more density, which uh, limits on that are going to include, you know, lack of infrastructure, lack of sewer, lack of water. But have you looked or have you considered looking beyond those eight counties to, to see the growth that's occurring? Because I think as, as our region grows, you're going to see counties like Stanley and Chester uh, and, and Rowan continue to absorb a lot of that growth. Uh, from single family standpoint there, as you said, there's just not the land area in Mecklenburg or Cabarrus mm -hmm. or other counties mm -hmm. and infrastructure is gonna be a limit on that as well. So as you move forward with the study, I would encourage that footprint to become a little broader in that perspective. Yeah, we, we, we will certainly do that. At, and also I believe that it takes a regional solution uh, to solve this problem as well. All right, we are out of time, folks. Thank you. Those are great, great questions. And and thank you to Dr. Chu for um, you know for providing us with some really interesting data to chew on. Um, so the plan for today, after I thank our sponsors one more time. So thank you to all our sponsors. Um, is to take a 10 minute break and then we will come back here and reconvene oh, with a post presentation panel discussion. So continuing with what we just started. So stay tuned if you're online and thank you for joining us today. <laughs>